All right. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Hello and hello. All right. My name is Fardad. F A R D A D. Haven't used a marker for two and a half years, so it's actually very enjoying to do so. Although I'm not going to use it much because I usually do stuff on a computer. Um, I'm going to take care of your OP345 this semester. Uh, we have an uh, awkward type of a thing, so uh, on the lab we're going to be here, but on Monday is going to be online. Um, and you notice that our class is between 5, 10, and uh, 7 o'clock or something, like 6, 6 something, 6, 6 something. And that's exactly five minutes after I have my class for OP244. And uh, that class is in person. So I have to somehow run from that thing and go to uh, uh, a place that I can set up my stuff and start teaching online, lecturing OP345. So, um, the recording. So, uh, OP345. So, what is uh, OP345? Essentially, OP345 is. Uh, uh, um, uh, going uh, deeper into concepts of C++. So the subject used to be before the OOP 345, when it was OOP 344 at the time, it was object-oriented, uh, advanced object-oriented programming using C++. Now it's kind of reversed. So you're essentially learning C++ using object-oriented concepts so that it's more focused on features of C++ rather than object orientation. Okay, uh, there are lots of uh, um, bits and parts that when we get to, um, again, I teach some stuff that are not in the curriculum, but I believe they're supposed to be there. Like, for example, when we get to threads, the multiprocessing and writing parallel programs, when we are doing that, the concepts that are mandatory to teach are very limited and um, it's not using all the good features that multi-threading can, can, uh, can do. So probably I'll teach that one, but when I'm testing, I'm going to only test the one that is on the... So if you're seeing in class, I'm talking about mutexes, and when you come to it, you'll see what I mean. When I talk about crazy stuff, you'll see that uh, what, is being, what you're being tested to will be what is on the curriculum, okay? Uh, office hours as usual, so let's um, 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 go for the very first thing that I have to say. Uh, the most important thing that you need to, to know is how I, uh, again, if you were my student, you already know this, but I have to mention it, especially to those people who are listening at home and want to know what the heck is going on. Just check to see if the microphone is on, otherwise it's just <laughs> silent movie. Yeah, so um, uh, um, anything I do in class immediately goes on GitHub. Okay, so uh, you don't need to take any notes. And for all those respected students that come to school with their notebooks, okay, if I see one person laughing at their screen, everybody lose their notebooks, okay? Which means nobody allowed to use any computer in my class. What is the reason? The reason is that <clears throat> um, uh, uh, based on research, when you take note with your hand, which means you are listening and you do something analog with your hand, you actually process the information and convert it to handwriting. Therefore, it gets committed to your long-term memory. Okay? When you are typing on a keyboard, you are doing Zippo. The only thing that it does is distraction. Okay? So, uh, if you are taking notes for accessibility reason, please be my guest do it. If you think and you've been done like uh, you have, this is just research, so maybe 30% of students are not like that. Uh, but if it becomes a point of distraction, I don't have time to check on students to see who is watching YouTube and who's listening. So then I have to stop everyone so I can teach in peace. I'm, I get distracted very easily. My apologies on that. Okay? Uh, I'm not a tough teacher. Um, uh, sharing the code, cheating is allowed as long as you tell me that you did it. Okay, when I say cheating, what is the difference between cheating and collaboration? What is the difference? 
The only difference between cheating and collaboration is that in collaboration, you get the code from someone else and you give credit to the person who have used the code from, right? Cheating is to get someone's code without acknowledging that this code is someone else's. Okay, that's the only difference. So that's why it's open. If you are doing some project, part of the project, if you are doing part of the workshop and you're stuck, you can't fix certain part and you want to hand it in, you're welcome to ask your friend that has a working piece, you get that working piece. Either you completely understand it, set it aside, write your own code, okay? And then tell that, write, uh, you're gonna cite it, that this piece of code, the logic is received from Jane. And, um, but I have changed it to my own. So I'm gonna take, compare this with Jane's. If it's really your code, you get the full mark. Mission accomplished. You look at the code of someone else's and you learn how to do it and you did it yourself. Good job, okay? And if I, even if I see, no, it's too close, it's almost a copy, then you only lose the mark for that part. So instead of 100%, you get a 90%, okay? And I think that's the logical thing to do. So <clears throat> by all means, if you need to get help from your friends, anyone, uh, your friend Google and uh, Stock Overflow and all those things that you're doing, if you're getting help with that, please, as long as you cite it, okay? And you mention in the file that you receive that you're actually doing from this line to that line, this function, that class, this logic is uh, by help of someone else, then either you say it's a copy or you're gonna say uh, I have changed it to my own. Then depending on those things, I'm gonna actually take a look at it and I'm gonna mark, mark you accordingly. This is not applied to quizzes, tests, and final test, okay? Because <laughs> I had a couple of plagiarism issues that, with, with students and they said, oh, you told us that we can copy someone else's work. Yes, you can, but you have to cite it. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't make sense to do it in a, in a test, okay? So, uh, So this is how I do it. So I create a new project for every single session that we have, and it's gonna be an empty project, obviously. This is 2019, but I'm gonna uh, uh, change it to um, 2022. I already created this, so let me just delete that one. For some reason, the, something didn't work, I had to. Okay, so let's go up. So code and select folder. So in here, I'm gonna say 01, it means first session, and it's gonna be September 7th. And I'm gonna click Create, and voila, we have our uh, project. So uh, another thing that you need to do is to go to, uh, um, what was it, Target Project? No, it wasn't, um, let me see. Um, um, I, I forgot actually where it was. I haven't taught this last semester. So it's at some place we have to go and set the standards to C++17. Um, probably in, uh, I'll find out and I'll let you know. Properties. Oh yeah, there you go. So uh, there you go. You see over here it says C++ language standard and it's ISO uh, C++14. You gotta change that one to either C++17 and 2017 is fine, okay? So you set it to that one, you click on apply, so it, other, otherwise some examples that you have, you will see it's not gonna work because everything that we are talking about is C++17 and further, okay? Uh, and if there is a C++20 part, you will see that it says it's C++20 so you can change your standards over here so your um, thing can follow, uh, your uh, um, uh, compiler can follow, and def obviously I'm gonna create a new item, I'm gonna call that prg.cpp, usually that's how I deal with it, and I start programming, and uh, uh, every time I have something new, I rename the file, so you have series of stuff in there, and you can see all my code as soon as I'm done. So uh, just to show you where it's gonna show up, so I'm gonna say include IO stream. so I'm, uh, using namespace, std int main c out oh not like that hello p345 and 
and return zero. Compile and run. All right. And it, it's going to show whatever we have. And then after I'm done with this part, what I do over here is going to the directory that I uh, created this, and it's on the repository. So Seneca 345, 345 notes. So I'll get in here. I'm going to right click and go add. Tortoise git is a shell for git commands. I'm going to add that to the repository. And I'm going to click on OK. Let's make that. Oh, that's OK. I want to say commit and push at the same time, but it didn't do. Anyways, so in here, I'm going to say hello. And I'm going to click on commit and push. And up it goes to GitHub. OK? So what will happen after this is that when you actually go to the notes in here, if I refresh, you will see that it is there. And that's the hello code over here. So essentially, you don't need to take any codes, any notes, any note that you have. It's going to be up on there. And uh, I put the two um, minimum requirements to uh, 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 move uh, a, a project from one place to another, which are the VCX project and VCX project filters. So if you copy this directory and just double click on VCX project, it opens a Visual Studio in a state that it was, and you can continue working with whatever you were working with. So that's how everything's going to uh, be when we are doing, uh, working in class. Uh, next thing, your first workshop is workshop zero. OK, it's what I do in this class. Those who are in OP244, you have to create a new one. You've already done it. Create a new one. Those who are, haven't been in my class, this is what you do. So when you are going to this, uh, the, the, there's a, a YouTube uh, playlist over here that when you go through it, it kind of have one, two, three, does all this stuff. You see, first you do this. So how to install Visual Studio, how to install Git, how to do potty. Every single thing over here is written. If you have done many st steps, just skip it. Uh, but when I say install potty and you are using some other terminal client to connect to uh, Matrix, please use putty because we may use features uh, that is uh, tailored to work with that ter uh, terminal client. So please do that. And it, it uh, tells you how to create a GitHub account and so on and so forth, which I'm going to explain right now. So what is, uh, what is Git? Anybody knows? What is Git? Do you know? Running it is a little too rich for our blood. Yes, we can do it using YAML files and stuff, but <laughs> go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we can keep track of changes. So you know what uh, um, uh, the, I keep forgetting that thing. It's a shame. Uh, Microsoft's thingy, what do you call it? That you put online on the cloud? OneDrive, OneDrive, OneDrive. I keep forgetting that. So the Microsoft OneDrive thingy, what is it? It's uh, something that you put your stuff in it and you can share with someone else, right? And they can do, yeah. So this uh, Git is something like that, but it's an intelligent one, OK? Uh, the story behind it is that uh, uh, you know that the biggest uh, open source project of all time is Linux. You know that, right? So the Linux operating system is the largest open source project that is out there. And uh, uh, when Linus Torvald actually created Linux and it introduced it to the world, uh, the uh, whole uh, uh, world exploded by, by collaboration and uh, adding features to Linux and managing all this new code be became difficult. So Linus Torvald created a new product called Git just to be able to manage those. So Git's job is to create, put a source code or, or whatever. It could be anything, any type of development thingy that you have on uh, a, um, um, uh, a clone of your directory. And everybody works on it. 
everybody apply the changes to it and everybody get the changes so we can all work on the same thing. So that's how I help students. Without a Git repository, I'm not going to help you. You need to have a Git repository. It's not because it just makes my life easier. The reason for this, again, if I sound like a broken, rec broken record for OP244 students, that was that were my students, my apology, uh, but uh, listen to it again, uh, you need to know this. So um, um, what I'm doing is that I am actually creating a history. I am, I am actually make you visible on internet. So what happens is that when you go for your co-op term, when you go for your interview in wherever, they Google your name, GitHub comes up. As soon as that thing comes up, it's like a green light that hire this person. Because there is no project, serious project in real world that is not on Git. It is impossible in some way. Even these days, if you are installing operating systems and like there are things called containers, I don't know if anybody knows what Kubernetes is, but it's, uh, it's like small uh, versions of operating system that are actually on Git and you want to install something, they actually pull something from Git and a whole operating system comes in and gets installed. Or so. so things like that is happening. Git is everything, okay? And if they know you have the knowledge for it, even basic knowledge for it, it means you're a better candidate. So how do we deal with it? You are going to first create an account on Git and please put your real name over there. A cool dude and prince of Persia is not a good thing to put over there, okay? All right, so uh, please put your real name over there. Uh, a, a nice ID, cat killer, not a good idea, because when you, so don't do that, right? Seriously, I'm, like internet never forgets, never forgets, okay? When you do something right, I'm not gonna say put like, like oh my God, nothing's available. Even your name, one, two, three, four, five is fine, okay? But please make sure that you put nice, uh, username, select good username for yourself. <clears throat> you can have several emails for now. Your primary email, set it to be Seneca's email. When you get graduated, you can change it to anything else you want. But for now, set it to that one because Git sends you messages when things change on repositories. And you know everything we do are on repositories. So, so a new workshop comes up, you don't need to wait for an announcement. Git immediately tells you that, hey, the workshop repository has changed, and you click on it, and you see it shows that a new thing is down there, and it's a new workshop that is, that is out. So all these things you can actually get from it, and it's very, very useful. The next thing that you're going to do after creating your uh, uh, I, uh, creating your account on GitHub is to create a repository. So a repository is essentially a, a directory, uh, an instance of Git. Let, let's, your three, four, five, we can actually talk properly on this. So each repository is an instance of Git, and Git is a distributed application. What is a distributed application and what is a client server application? A client server application is like FTP. You have a server somewhere, you have an FTP client, you connect to it. It's like Telnet is a, a, a client server. You have a Telnet server, you have a Telnet client, SSH client, you connect to it, you do something, all right? Git is a distributed uh, application, which means each instances, instance of Git is a fully functional uh, <clears throat> application of Git. So the Git application on GitHub and the Git application on my computer are identical. No difference. Anything you can do on Git, you can do it on your own computer. Even if you want, you can share the repository. If you have a computer that is always connected to internet, you can actually share a repository on your computer with some other person as if you are the GitHub. You can do that. But of course, not worth it, it's free. It's always on the cloud, nothing's, so nothing's gonna get lost. So what, this is what you do. You create a repository, you call it, for example, OP345 works and you do everything. You live and breathe your OOP345 material in that repository. It's as if you have a directory that you only, you do have a directory for Seneca, right? Hopefully you don't spread everything everywhere. And you have directories for your subjects. So you make the directory of the 345 a repository on Git. So on GitHub, you go over there, you create a repository called OP345Works, then you come on the computer over here, you clone it. So you have two instances of the same thing, one on GitHub, one on your computer. You make 
you add me as a collaborator to your repository on GitHub. So what happens? You are, and, and you start working on your uh, computer. So the first word that you use that is a git command is a clone. Clone means to clone a, 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 a repository from, uh, one, uh, uh, from one source to another, okay, to uh, duplicate it. Then what you do, on your repository at home, it's a directory. There's not, as you see, they're all directories. So when I look at these, when I look at the repositories over here, see this, this one over here? There we go. So this is my sandbox. It's a repository. I do all my stuff in here, okay? Final test, stop project, anything that I do, I write it in there. It's my sandbox. I play in it, okay? This is your repository that you got to, it's read-only for you. You can clone it, but you can only pull into it from GitHub. You cannot push into it because it's read-only for you. Okay, it's a public repository. Anybody can clone it, fork it. Forget about fork. Anybody can clone it and uh, uh, have it on your computer. Anytime I put something new over there, you don't need to download the entire thing. All you need to do, you go on your repository and you say, pull. It's, it knows where it's, it's upstream. It knows where is its origin. Therefore, it's going to get all the changes from the original uh, repository, and your repository is going to be updated with the new, new material that I put over there. And you can continue doing that. I will do the same thing with yours, which means you make your repository private. Most important thing. If it's public, it's plagiarism. Because anybody can go and pick up your codes, anything you write. Careful. It has to be private. Then you add me as a collaborator. Therefore, I have read-write access to your repository too. Done? Then at home, you are doing your workshop. You want to go to washroom? You say, commit, going to washroom. You go to washroom. So anytime you are leaving your code for any reason, you commit it. These commits are actually turning points or, yeah, turning points of your application. That could be uh, uh, a bug I cannot fix, commit. Like a bug in, I don't know, I can, uh, in uh, uh, invoking a threat. I need to help for, uh, for get help from Fardad. You commit it. Then you come on Microsoft Teams. You say, Fardad, my, uh, um, I just committed. I have a problem with Workshop 3. Can you take, take a look at it? I'll open Microsoft Teams screen share, but I'm not going to share your screen. I'm going to share my own screen. And then I'm going to go on GitHub. I'm going to pull your repository from GitHub. Therefore, everything that you have in your latest state is going to be there. I'm, I'm going to open up, I'm going to fix it, make sure it works and everything. Then I'm going to commit my changes, and I say as far as fixes, I commit it, and I push to GitHub. All you need to do to do a pull, and your workshop is working right now. Your obligation will be to only reflect on what I did to make it work. And how you do it, you tell to GitHub, show me the differences from previous version. GitHub puts, not GitHub, sorry, Git. Git lists two sourcing. At left side is yours. At right side is the new one. It shows exactly what is changed and highlights everything. So you literally go through it, understand what happened. You reflect about it. You far that helped me with this and that and that. I had problem this. I forgot to dis nullify this one. I forgot to deallocate whatever. Whatever the reason thing was, you write everything over there, and you're done. So help sessions are going to be done like this. We're not going to. Um, you know, do it uh, as like a dinosaur's time. We're going to do it in a, uh, uh, the way it's done in real world. And that's how it's done. Uh, there is a second rule for getting help. Come in. There is a, if you're my student, of course, <laughs> otherwise stay up. Okay, so uh, uh, the second rule, come in. Second rule for the, for the class is when you have a problem, you have to come with two, part, two pieces of information for me. Number one, what is wrong? My program doesn't work because yada, 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 yada. Okay? Number two, what did you do to fix it and it didn't work? Okay? You cannot come to me and say, my workshop doesn't work. Can you fix it for me? No, I can't. That's not helping you. 
Okay? I need to know what the, you need to know what your problem is. If you go to a doctor, a doctor, something's wrong with me. What? Like, I have a headache, my, my, my nose is runny, I have coughs. So you have to tell the doctor what's wrong. Otherwise, just fix me, that doesn't work that way, right? It's the same thing. I'm not claiming that I'm a doctor. I'm, <laughs> I'm nothing of a sort, but hey, um, uh, code doctor I am, let's put it that way. So, so please, that's what you need to do, and it's extremely important for me, for me for you to do so. Um, <clears throat> so these are the things, and that's your workshop zero. Uh, you have till, uh, you have till, the, till the first time that you want to ask help to do it, and do it today. Not like, oops, it's a mistake. Let me start doing workshop zero now. Don't do it. Remember, when, I am, when, when you have 79.3%, and I want to decide if this is an A or a B plus, GitHub is where I go to. I go to your repository, see how active you are. What did you do? What are the things you have done? All the history of your work in OOP 345 will be in your repository. If I see you're an active student, you have everything set over there, you did your workshops, you're, you, you are a person who's actually trying to learn, then of course you, your mark is going to be that. I'm, not, I'm never going to like, bring you down. But I'm never going to use this feature to lower anything. Okay? So remember, like if you are uh, 80 percent, like, I don't know, if you are 81 percent, I'm never going to make it 79 because of this, okay? So never down, it's always for positive. It, all these things are all done with positive stuff. If you're a genius person, you know everything, then by all means, don't do any of that and get your A plus and get out of here, okay? So that's that. Um, so let me take a look at these things and see what I've missed. So, yeah, my name is Fardad, you know that. It's actually a copy of the lead of the course that is Cornell Barna. I just changed Cornell Barna to Fardad Salim Al Okay, so, <laughs> so the lectures uh, are, are going to be on Big Blue Button, uh, um, uh, as usual. Um, Big Blue Button is an open source uh, application, and Seneca code is in it. Okay, we have lots of students working on it, and many features of Big Blue Button have, are, are done by students that, was, that came right out of this subject, and also the students who are hired by Big Blue Button, four of them right now. Actually, Fred was telling me, I want to hire more people. Do you have anyone or not? Sadly, you need to have a very good uh, skill to, to, to actually be able to do some, to, to actually work for them. Anyways. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a video I created. Pr I presume that's the one, unless Cornell created. So how to log into uh, to uh, Big Blue Button? Uh, asking her, uh, uh, for Git, uh, asking for help. We use Git. You see this over here. So I've written all the things that I mentioned over here quickly to tell you exactly how you do it and what you do. So the workshop that I created is for OOP 244. So any place you hear OOP 244, you change it to OOP 345. Okay. It's the same thing, no difference. Um, uh, you know about matrix access, you have time zones, we know that. Uh, I don't think time zone is an any issue at, uh, because we have an in-person thing. We're going to talk about that. Uh, now we have more people over here, so we're going to talk about that again. Okay. Uh, uh, quizzes, we're going to have quizzes. So the quizzes that you have uh, is going to be uh, each quiz will have two type of question questions that are on the material you have uh, uh, already been lectured on, and the small piece on the material that you are about to be lectured on, okay? Uh, the questions that comes from future notes are concept only. I'm not going to ask you to write any code, do any debugging, do any walkthrough. I'm just going to ask about the topics of the thing. So if like, what is multi-threading? And I'm going to give you four answers to see if you know what is multi-threading because you, you are ready for my lecture. And I, unlike others, I don't like you to study, to learn before you come to class. Because if you get it wrong, it's much more difficult to fix it. I rather have fresh brains to work on, okay, to implant the proper information in it. So if you are, of course, if you want to go deep in it, it's your choice. But you don't have to study, study it. Just read the material, see what, understand what are we talking about, 
definitions and descriptions, that's it. You don't need to actually write any code when you're doing so. Uh, project's going to come up. It's going to be on GitHub. Midterm is going to be on week seven. We know that. Final is going to be on 14th. You have a class on 20th, on, on Monday. Your lab is on Monday. No, your lab is on, uh, this today is Wednesday. Is the 14th, let me see when is, I want to see if, we, if, if you have a class at the thing. So uh, October, November, December 14th is the last day. So yes, you're, you're going to be on, on week 14, okay? If you were on Thursday or on Friday, we had to do it on week 13 because, and it's going to be done during the lab and it's going to be on uh, uh, the computer. So if you are more comfortable with your own computer, bring it. Other than that, you have to use uh, the computers we have over here. It's exactly uh, how you have done it before on, on uh, uh, computer, but the difference would be you have a strict time to start and end. You cannot do it anytime you want. It's not like it's open for two days and do it. You come to the thing, it's, it's, it's the exact same test that you have done before, but on a computer instead of a paper, okay? Um, for, for those students who are accommodated, um, um, letters of accommodation, please send it to me so I can make all the automatic stuff work. So I'm going to set it to the submit uh, the submitter program. So the submitter program uh, knows that you're accommodated and gives you the extensions that you need. And also Blackboard, I'll do that one so you have more time. If you need to be in a specific, like if you need to be down in, uh, um, 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 I don't know, I forgot what the name was. By the way, if you're supposed to be in a separate room um, uh, to, for concentration and stuff, um, just if you send me your letter of accommodation, I know what needs to be done and I'm going to set it up for you. <clears throat> All right, uh, we're in action. Um, extensions. <clears throat> um, um, don't make it a habit, okay? If you need an extension for something, let me know and I'll give you extension. As long as you're doing it. I'd rather you do it than copy it from someone else. If you need a couple of more days, sure, I'll give it to you, okay? But you need to send an email to me or talk to me on Microsoft Teams. Um, yeah, and hopefully I'll catch it on time and I'll, and I'll give you the thing. So don't leave it for the last minute. Usually when you start something, and it's like two, three days to the due date, you know that something's wrong and I need more time on this. If that's the case, ask it early because last minute or after the fact, that's a no-no. If uh, something happens, you are coming for a test and you can't come, you don't have internet or something, make a phone call, write my number down from the faculty information, leave a message telling that this happened uh, not two weeks later that I was sick two weeks ago in final test. That's not going to work. You have to mention exact as soon as possible if you don't have access to internet. If you do, send me an email, okay? But it has to be done during or before or immediately after the test. Or um, in an unfortunate situation, if you cannot send it, then I'll know. Like you've been in hospital in the past two days and you can send me an email. I'm, I'm, I, if, I hope that never happens, but uh, if it does, then that's okay. All right, uh, so faculty information is there. You have all my stuff in here. Um, if you click over here, it actually takes you to the, uh, uh, to Microsoft Teams, to the office. And you, if you look at it, you'll see you're already a member. If you are not, you can always click on it and ask me to, to, uh, um, to uh, bring you in. Uh, respect the dot. Please. <laughs> All right. That thingy over there. All right. If it's uh, red, don't send me a message. Okay. If it's away or it's available, you can call me. Don't say, can I call you? No. Call me. Okay. Two things happen. Either I'm at the computer, answer the question, and pick it up, or I'll come and I'll see there's a missed call and I'll call you back. Okay. I guarantee that I will be at the computer during my office hours. 
So if you look at the weekly schedule over here, you will see that over here it says office hours. During these times, I will be at my computer, okay? If not, while you're looking at the question, is that okay? Like, that's, that, that, that's what I'm saying. So if, if I am, if, uh, uh, so um, I'll come to that point. Give me a second. So if, uh, if uh, what I was saying, see, that's how easily I get distracted by someone's look. Just a second. She was looking. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me know what I was saying. Yeah, so if I am not able to be there, I actually will have a cancellation notice for it. So if something happens and I cannot be at the office, there's a meeting or something happens, it's like a class cancellation. I cancel that thing. And if you have class at that time, any other time of the day, 24-7, I don't care, okay? Call me and I'll call you back as soon as I can, okay? So office hours all the time, okay? Office hours all the time, anytime I'm, av I'm available, okay? Uh, available or away, okay? In any other situations, please don't message me, okay? If you see I'm available or away, then send me a message or ju just call me and I'm gonna call you back, okay? Or if you feel a message suffices and you want to just tell me something or uh, um, I don't know, then you can send, of course, send me a message, but uh, if you want to talk to me, call. Don't ask for permission, please. Um, so that's official thing, and uh, no matter where I put my office hours, somebody has a class at that time. So my apologies on that. And hopefully it's gonna be, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, so I, I, as I was talking about, now we have more people in here. So I'm gonna talk about the same thing that I said again. I have a class over here, as you see, <clears throat> uh, OP244NAA, and in five minutes, I have to run from building A. Actually, I am in building A, so it's not much of running, but uh, I have to go from there, find an office, set up equipment, connect to internet, and start the lecture uh, with the equipment over here. What I have as home is much more sophisticated, and I can uh, teach from home much better when it's online. So if everybody's okay with that, we can make this five to seven, to seven to nine, something like that, okay? So switch it back two hours, and, uh, or, and uh, because I wanna make sure everybody can be at home, you have enough time to get home. So we're gonna do it seven to nine, but we're gonna be at home, everybody's gonna be at home, we're gonna sit over there and in our comfort of our home, we're gonna go through the, the online session instead of being at school, uh, being distracted and using uh, equipments that may not work, okay? so. It is your choice, think about it. If you're okay, we're gonna switch this online times from five to seven to seven to nine, okay? And when I say seven to nine, you know what happens. Sometimes it's seven to 8.30, sometimes it's seven to 11, Depend on <laughs> depending on how much time we have, well, what we have to cover. And uh, uh, brings me to another thing, labs are not labs, okay? The labs that you're having over here is not a lab. You are not supposed to bring your workshop over here and start working on it. You are supposed to start your workshop, do it, come here with problem. Because most of the time, I'm gonna use this for lecture. It is a complicated subject and 250 minutes per week, no way anybody can finish this, okay? Especially when it comes to parts that is very confusing. I don't. I don't want to push it, okay? So workshops, you come to workshop with problem, you don't bring your workshop over here and start from zero. That's not gonna work out. You won't be able to do anything and I won't be able to help you because I'm not gonna help you type, okay? It's not gonna work that way. So keep that in mind, please. Start the work immediately and at many moment you have time, it's lab time. If you have problem, call me, I'll take you through it and see uh, how can I help you, okay? So remember about that. Uh, what else do we have? And now, for example, this, the, the, your lab will always be cut short. I have to go five, 10 minutes early because from here I have to go A4501 in five minutes, start another lect, start actually a lecture, not a lab. So all these things happening in school, you know that five minutes is very difficult to, to run from here to the other side of the building 
and set up everything and hopefully uh, everything works. Um, sorry, today is all about all these things, uh, little things that we are going to uh, do. I want to see, yeah, so uh, the book is moved to uh, an OER system that is on Git. What a big surprise. It's open source. So essentially, uh, the books that you had on uh, uh, Matrix, it's now on Git, okay? Uh, so, um, uh, oh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, it's a Git system, and you're gonna, you, you, can, you can go through every single part of the book uh, using this system, and it's linked to it, so you can actually see how it works. So it's an OER system, and um, uh, the, um, all the uh, course material are there. Do we have a textbook for, the, for C++? I mentioned this to OP students, and I'm going to also mention it to you. Um, um, I can tell you books that are good as, uh, to be used for, for C++. It's uh, uh, helpful and uh, thing to actually tell you when the uh, uh, w uh, what kind of book to get, but there is uh, a problem with that. Problem is that uh, uh, sometimes the method and way people uh, write text is not understandable for you. So I always give the example is that I cannot pick your girlfriend for you. I cannot pick your boyfriend for you. You, you need to know who suits you, right? Books are like that. So let a couple of weeks pass, do a couple of weeks pass, it, pass and it's, so you are kind of in C++ and you know which parts you're weak and you want to have, uh, you want to, uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, refer to another uh, source other than internet. So what you do is, first you close the door so people don't shout outside, then uh, what you do, you go to any of these, uh, big bookstores, like, I don't know, Indigo chapters, and you get five C++ textbooks, dif different ones, that they're all C++ 1720, okay? Not old ones. You take them, you put it in front of you, at the topic that you have problem in, you go and read it in all those five books and see which one is more understandable for you. That's your textbook. C++ is an ancient language when it comes to computer science. It's a very old language, uh, and because of that, there are so many different textbooks out there that you cannot believe it. So many people like to have examples. So they like to get something like Dital and Dital, where uh, it gives you examples and gives you tests after it's everything. Many people like reference book, where they uh, go to the point, they don't babble around, they just talk about the thing they want. Again, that's, then that C++ reference is your, is your friend. So depending on what you like, select the proper book. Uh, worst come to worst, after a week you don't like it, you can give it back and get another one, right? So that's that one. But of course, if you go to the course outline, it probably suggests to you what kind of book he is. Uh, uh, this is not the course outline? Where is the course outline? Oh, learning Gotham extensions, yada, yada, yada. No, they don't have it. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, that's my suggestion. Do it that way. All right. Next, what do we have? Uh, we talked about quizzes, uh, lectures we know, big blue button, you know how to get into it, and so on and so forth. We have no problem with that. Uh, just want to see if I missed anything. What else we talked about? Any questions, anyone? Yes. I am. It's like this is not a half and half thingy. No, no, no. Oh no, no. That half, half and half thingy doesn't like. It's only in summer. I hate it. Everybody hates it. But it's uh, uh, the rules. We cannot teach more than ten months. You know that, profs. Any other question? Yes. Oh yes, that's where you're going to, if you get help from me, apart from the reflection that you're gonna have, you're gonna actually write what did I help you with. That it's all demonstrated in the workshop thingy, so you have it. And you'll see exactly how things work over there, so don't worry about it. 
and I'll show it over here too. <clears throat> but install all the stuff for all those who have MacBooks. My apologies, you have to uh, uh, install uh, a virtual machine and put Windows on it. You need Visual Studio. You cannot procrastinate on it because soon you're going to have stuff that nothing works other than when you are going to uh, classes that you need Microsoft Foundation classes and you, you do game programming and all those things, then you can't sit. <laughs> yeah, if you already set it up, then that's fine. Like many people do boot camp for Macs, which splits the computer in two. Half of your hard drive becomes Windows, the other half becomes like that. I don't like it because you lose half the storage that you have. Um, I, what I like about virtual machines, especially, I think it's called Fusion. Uh, uh, for that's from uh, VMware. Uh, so if you install Fusion, the good thing is that you define uh, a certain size. Say I want 60 gigs of hard for my Windows. It only use, it expands it into small pieces of file. So if it's 30 gigs, it uses 30 gigs. And when you shut it down, if the, the computer is completely yours. There's no problem. And if you want a Windows with full power, see how many cores your uh, 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 app, uh, your your uh, Mac has, like if it has four cores, tell to your virtual machine, I want four CPUs with 60 gigs of RAM. And when you run it, it fully becomes like a fully functional computer, it's fast and good and everything. Of course, your Mac's not going to work properly. But the problem is that there is no problem because you just shut it down or suspend it or pause it and you have full power back. So that's a very good thing. You don't have a Mac, you know, because <laughs> your look was like, oh my goodness. But no, that's, that's, you don't have a Mac, you don't need to worry about it. All right, that's one of the things that I missed in, if you've been in my class, every three minutes I poll you, you know, bing, bing, and I keep asking questions. Over here, I look at your eyes, and I see, and I see if you're, I used to be looking at faces, but now I'm getting better with eyes, so, because <laughs> people are covered, but okay. All right, uh, uh, any other question before we continue? All right, so let's chat about the timing that we have for, for the thing on Microsoft Teams. Uh, and I need to have everybody's uh, okay with it. And then uh, we'll switch it like that so uh, uh, we can do it that way. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, in the lab. No, I don't, I've never done paper. I don't like paper. Paper cuts? Cutting trees, I don't like it. We have that, we have it over here, what's the difference? Like I, I can write it exactly like a paper, but on Blackboard. Instead of writing, you type so I can actually see what you're writing, not decipher your handwriting, right? All right. <laughs> I'm saying that because my handwriting is horrible, because every time I mark a paper, I mark a paper, then I have to explain to them that, what that mark is, because they can't read it. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> that's, that's my bad. Uh, all right. Um, so let's uh, let's start our talk. I'm just gonna uh, quickly go through the, uh, the the topics that it kind of fill in the blanks, brings us to the level of OP three four five when we want to actually talk about C plus plus and object orientation. Uh, first of all. Uh, Let's appreciate and remember what the, uh, uh, the three plus one concepts of object orientation is, uh, the R, which, which uh, three are the major ones, and a plus one that is kind of, uh, uh, I would call it maybe plus two, yeah. Uh, so it's three plus two, actually, let's put it that way. The three concepts of object orientation are, so, uh, the way I do it in on, on Big Blue Button is I, that I, that I uh, get a random name that it comes up and you answer the question. If you don't want, you say pass and you go to the next person, right? Over here, my random question is like that. So the gentleman over here either answers the question or is not in a mood or want to talk about it. If he says pass, then that lady is going to be my victim, okay? And I keep going like that until I get my answer or I don't get my answer and I'm going to... So remember those three major things that we have to follow in object orientation. What are they? And? 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 Thank you. Inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. And uh, encapsulation was what? Remember that? Um, 
and logic and the data logic uses. So if we want, to, if, when we put the logic and the data that logic needs to follow to do something together in a package, we call that encapsulation. Like a, 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 a human being and its height. So these are the things that we want to do, or a car, a car and its color, or a car and type of engine. So these things like that, like what the, like the car moves, the type of engine moves it, so, so on and so forth. So we put the data, that something, we put it together, the data and behavior, they call it. We put it together and that is called encapsulation. What is polymorphism? Do you remember that? Doing the same thing in different ways. Absolutely right. Doing the same thing in a different ways. Bicycle, uh, airplane flies, pigeon flies, uh, helicopter flies. They all fly, but in a different way. Okay, so the action of flying in the hierarchy of flying objects is a polymorphic thing because it works in many different ways. They are all flying, but they are doing in different ways. And remember what inheritance was? When we have one thing and we inherit another thing, what does that mean? It's like uh, we have one class and we... Um... Don't use class. Then we become okay. C++. Mm. What is inheritance? Car is a vehicle. Huh? Car is a vehicle. Car is a vehicle is inheritance. So that's by example. So car is a vehicle is inheritance, which implies inheritance is? Inheriting a data or information from one thing to another. Okay, and that's called recursion, by the way. What is recursion? Recursion is using something in itself. So in, what is inheritance? Is inheriting something in something else? <laughs> so using the name in itself, that's, recur that's recursion. Uh, it's not a valid thing. Inheritance is? <laughs> inheritance is? Very easy answer to that. Um, inheritance is uh, one object. Object to inherit the properties and functions from the original one. Object and see, it shows that all of you know what inheritance is, and not one of you is can actually explain it. Which is bad. It's actually good that you know it, but if you are going to for an interview, you need to be able to explain what it is, right? In an easy way so everybody understands. Okay, so you you are all right. But inheritance, first and but foremost, reusing your code. Okay, number one, inheritance is to reuse your code. How? How? By reusing design. That's another thing, which means you use the definition of an already existing object, which is called a class, and you build another class out of it that either improves or limits the capabilities of the parent class or object, okay? So object is not a good thing to say because some people get confused. Object can be used in both ways because object usually means an instance of a class. You cannot inherit from my BMW. I don't have one, but if I had one, okay? You can inherit from a BMW 320 and create five different ones, five different versions, ones, a sport one a, and something like that. Or you can say, I have a bicycle, I put uh, an engine uh, to, on a definition of a bicycle, therefore I can have series of different types of motorcycles. So motorcycle is a bicycle with an engine. But you cannot say Jack's motorcycle, uh, Jack's bicycle, if I put an engine of it, then all those things are motorcycles. It doesn't happen that way. You change the definition. So what is an object? Object is an instance of a class. It's like when I say integer, i. Integer is a class, i is the object. So usually when we are talking about inheritance, unlike what you have in bad examples, like father and son, mother and daughter, that's not inheritance. They are actually mother and daughter, they are actually instances of same object that is a, a, a female human being. Mother has a function called birth that returns a human being, that could be any gender. So as you see, when you are doing object-oriented design, what you have in real world, the, the uh, 
uh, words that you have mean slightly different, okay? So human, male, female, that's inheritance, okay? But uh, me and my father, we have nothing to do with each other with respect of inheritance. We are just instance of the same object, okay? All right, so well, now we know what the three things are, okay? So these are the three things. Now, plus two I said, okay? Plus one, one of these two actually is related to object orientation, and we need to know that. It's called synergy. What is synergy? It means using these three features in harmony, not to randomly put an inheritance over there, a polymorphic thing over there, and, and do some encapsulation over there, and then I have an object-oriented system. No, all these things must work together in harmony, in design, to make something object-oriented. Just the fact that you inherited something in a program, and you have a function with two functions with the same name in a program, and you have a structure in a program, a, a class in a program that has three methods, that doesn't mean that your program is object-oriented. It just means you use some features of the language, okay? So synergy is the most important thing, which means the design is object-oriented. Everything works together as an object-oriented thing. And the plus two, two so the second one, that applies to all programming languages, not object-orientation, is... Anybody remembers? What do you need to be able to do to program? Otherwise, you cannot. In any language, in anything. You need to do one thing. You need to be capable of doing only one thing to be able to program. Otherwise, you're incapable of programming. And that's 90% of the problem of students. And that's what you are learning in college. It's called abstraction. Okay? You need to be able to learn to limit yourself. If you don't know how to limit yourself, you cannot program. If I want to create a doctor's office, and you think about if the doctor is bald or not, that's not going to do anything. You don't need to have all the features of everything implemented. You need to only focus on what your application needs and be able to ignore the rest. If you can't do that, you're going to be trapped in an endless loop of redesigning and never be satisfied by your work because you keep adding and adding and your, uh, your program bloats for no reason. So abstraction is the most important thing that you need to do as a programmer. You need to look what you need and be able to ignore everything else and then start doing your design, okay? Very important. So these are the three concepts of uh, thing. And I just went through three lines of the first day. So as I told you, it's not going to be enough to, to go through everything. So I'm going to um, um, talk about it. Uh, modularity that we use uh, in, in uh, C++ usually relates that we say uh, we put one class in one module. Do you remember what modules were? She's too busy writing. Remember what modules were? Ah. One class. Like put one class in one file. One class in one file. One class in two files. <laughs> okay. One CPP, one header file, right? We put one class in two files and we call it one module. Essentially, but that's the OP244 aspect of it. You don't usually do that. You put one class and all its closed belongings. You could have two classes in one module. Like if I'm creating an array, an array has two classes. One is the array, the other one is the element. But the element cannot exist without an array. It's tightly closed to an array. You cannot have an array without an element. You cannot have an element without an array. A an element cannot be constructed separately. You have to create an array, and inside array come the elements, right? Because of that, the module for a class could be an element and its array. So you may have two classes in a module, depending on what you do, three classes. But again, all the things that are tightly related, they get into uh, a code and an introduction uh, file for it, introductory file for it that we call header file that, that explains, that kind of introduces all the aspects of the module to the outside 
application. Are we okay with this? So this is one module. And when, <clears throat> when we have module, the building blocks that we actually use for these, the, the things that are actually create the, all these modules, uh, they're listed over here. I can actually put it up here. I'm actually putting it in here and I'm just talking about it, so why don't you just see it? Are these, so you have values. Values are essentially literal values that you have. Three, five, two, something like that, instances that you have. You have objects that are instances of classes. You have variables, which are uh, uh, memory spaces in which you can put different values and the values change. You have references, which are essentially new name for already existing things. So you can have one thing that have five different names, but the target is, every, is the same. My name is Fardad, call me Freddy. Freddy and Fardad are the same people. I don't have two human beings, it's only one, right? That's the thing, so references are like this. Uh, we have functions which are essentially the, uh, 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 co the, the collection of instructions to follow a very small goal within a big uh, picture. So a function accomplishes a specific task within a big picture, okay? We have types which differentiates uh, between the types of the variables, so based on types, the size of memory and what do we have in there uh, is different. So uh, types are things that a program understands, your, your compiler understands and can recreate instances out of. Types could be classes, there are no pr problem with them, which uh, the class members are uh, the uh, variables, uh, the data what we put through encapsulation inside the class. We have templates that are essentially uh, an instruction to the compiler how to write code. So when you know the logic applies to 50 different types, you don't write 50 different functions. You write one function and ask the compiler to rewrite the code on demand based on what type we want that object to be, that thing to be read it. Re written, you know that from the latest things of OB244, right? Templates, remember that? So, and we had the templates, like the class templates are actually, I don't think we actually did class templates, we only did function templates. I think I gave some example about class templates, and I told you you're gonna read much more about it in OP345. Good news or bad news, everything in C++ is template. Everything in C++ is template. You'll come to it soon and you see without templates you cannot breathe in C++, okay? So <clears throat> let's put it like this. You, have you seen that commercial that says uh, um, um, you wanna do this, there's an app for that? It was an old commercial on Apple, I think it was, that says there's an app for it. Anything that you see, like I wanna do this, there's an app for it, okay? Anything you want to do in C++, there's a template for it, anything. So sometimes people say like, why do I need to even learn data structures when everything is already implemented in templates? Um, we'll come to that point later, but uh, yes, anything that you want to do is actually in templates. So class templates, regular templates, and what is namespaces? Namespaces we already talked about in OP244 is essentially uh, a, a scope we create to prevent conflict uh, between names. Okay, so when you have several different sections of the code that are uh, uh, working on different goals of creating the main application, you, uh, you sometimes have different abstractions of the same things. I have uh, a student from the accounted department is a completely different entity than a student from education department. An education department needs to know what courses the student passed, an accounting department needs to know how much loan the student got, right? So it's a different types of thing. And they are both called student. So if we want to create them in an application, we're gonna have a name conflict. We cannot create two classes with the name student, therefore we create two namespaces, one accounting, one uh, EDU, and then uh, we freely create two classes with the same name, and now we have two namespaces that can carry all those things. And we know all the names, and namespaces actually came late in C++. Uh, at initially, uh, I'm, I'm very old. <laughs> there was no namespaces, but when the namespaces came in, they decided to say anything that is standard in C++ that comes with the compiler and language, we put it in a namespace called STD. Hence the using namespace STD anywhere as you see. So anything that comes from before is in namespace STD. 
Ta-da! Those are the building blocks that we went through. Types, object type, hardware information. Um, so essentially, when you are when you create when you when you have an object, that object comes from a type, and that type, depending on type of hardware, will be implemented differently depending on a hardware. Therefore, you have an integer that in one platform is 32 bits, in the other platform is 64 bits. Okay, that's primitive ones, but uh, yeah, keep that in mind. And uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, Types, the types come in three different ways. The types that compiler defines, okay, that you, you have, uh, fundamental types we call it. There are other types that compiler cannot decide on it because it comes from hardware. Those types compiler cannot change. It, it's dictated by the compiler. Those are the built-in types. And then you have user-defined types that essentially sky's the limit. Create a class, do whatever you want, array, stuff like that. So you create uh, a class out of uh, the combination of fundamental types and built-in types to satisfy the need of your application, and therefore that, those are the, uh, the uh, user-defined types. User-defined types essentially is what we call as classes and structures and things like that, and, and arrays. Um, <clears throat> declaration, you know exactly what it is. When you're talking about declaration, you're identifying uh, 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 what uh, you're identifying a type to other uh, parts of the program. And when you are identifying something, it comes in different scopes. How you actually deal with those things is one thing. One is called, uh, we call it a local scope. So when you are uh, creating uh, something in a local scope, it's within an open bracket and a curly bra uh, closed bracket. It could be anywhere in or in the program or up to a function or a class, uh, mm, I'm not gonna say class, as, as big as a function. And these are all uh, the type of things that we call local scopes. So anything you create in a function, anything you create in an if statement. So if you have an if statement, open curly bracket, write integer i, close curly bracket, that i is only living at the first section of an if statement, and after that's gonna be gone, okay? Things like that, remember that. Okay, class scope is a, uh, essentially uh, uh, a type that's gonna get regenerated in different objects of a class, and it's tied to the object of the user-defined type that we have, and it lives within the existence of that object. So as long as that object is alive, all the functions inside that object have access to the class. So uh, to the, to the um, uh, um, um, variable inside the class, okay, or type inside the class. But the thing is that, the declaration inside the class. But remember, we kind of can talk about that as a global variable inside the class for all the member functions. Bad way of saying it, but fits nicely for C students, is that a class, when you're talking about a class scope, anything you define inside the class is global to all the methods inside that class, okay? and nowhere else. Outside of the class, no one can see it. And they live as long as this, the instance of that class is alive. As soon as the instance is gone, all those things inside that scope are gone too. And global scope is the one that lives throughout the execution of your program. And the global scope comes in different, in different ways and shapes. It comes in a way that its lifetime is global, which means they don't have the external linkage, they have internal linkage, which means they are alive uh, uh, throughout the execution of the program, but they are not accessible everywhere. Those are when you create something called a static variable. So you can create a static variable, and a static variable remains alive if the function ends and comes back, it's still there. We're gonna come to it and you'll see, okay? Uh, so, uh, stuff like that. And then we have uh, global variables that are truly global. You have experienced that in your project in OP244. Extern, you created. Anything that you created extern, you created in one module, it remains alive and is accessible to all modules. So that's an external linkage. If it's not specified to be used all over the module using an extern, then it becomes internal linkage. In C, we used to call those things global, but they were not really global. They were just accessible in one module of your application. Yeah, I think we talked about those things. Compilers. 
translators for your application. They are gone after you are done your program. You don't need them. If you need your compiler to run your program, it means you don't have a compiler. Okay, that's an interpreter. Okay, compilers, you compile your code, it translates your code from uh, a human language to machine language. When I say human language, I'm saying C++. C++ is human language, okay? Uh, we understand it. Computer doesn't have any idea what C++ is. Zero knowledge. Therefore, we have a compiler that can easily translate that into machine code, and machine can run it. And compilers run as follows. So what you have, if this is, an, again, an OOP244 thing that I talk about, but here I'm going to repeat it again. So you have different modules for a compiler, and when you run a compiler, compiler runs to the number of modules that you have. If you have four modules in an application, your compiler gets executed four, four times to compile every module individually by itself and creates an object file out of each module if there is no problem. You can make many promises in modules and compiler says, okay, I believe you. You can say there is a class somewhere called this and that. You can say, you can say there is a function that is this and that. Put it in a header file and use that function in your module. It compiles it. But when it comes time to linkage, that's when the promises you made in your header file should actually be kept, which means if in the first header file, number one, you not is actually that's not the case that it's worked in, in if in if in module three you are using something of module two the linker makes sure that is actually there okay and then puts them all together in one executable so four executions and then after that one link you do that with dash o in your uh, compile line so you can if you if you want to compile individual things that's why you can compile one module successfully but your program crashes and doesn't they don't get compiled because the promises you made you did not keep them so the preprocessor stuff happens before all this okay which means before any of these compilations happens you tell to the compiler I want such and such happen I want to, I want to change all these to that before you do this I want to um, convert all these calculations to, to that type of calculation before it. Doing all these things happen with the hashtag that you add at the beginning. So the hashtag is not C++, it's C++ compiler language. You are actually telling the compiler to do something before compilation. Like include, when you're saying include what happens, you're essentially including, co copying and pasting a code from another place into your code. That's literal. What I'm saying is a literal thing. It's not a joke. That's exactly what happens. I'll give you an example on it the next day that you're coming in. And uh, yeah, so that's compilation. And uh, the, the first thing is preprocessor directives, which are the hashtag ones. It happens before compilation. Then your compilation happens. If everything's OK, then link happens. Everything is OK. It compiles and it crashes. You have to go back and try to fix everything. That's the worst type of error. Compilation is a beautiful thing because you can see what's wrong, you, you go find out somehow. The worst type of comp problems are runtime errors. When you think everything's good, but it's not, okay? <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned into my OP244 class, 10% uh, of your time you're writing programs in your career, in your life. 90% of your time you're debugging, okay? And that's, that's a fact, okay? You're either debugging, if you're lucky, you're debugging your own code. If you're unlucky, you're debugging someone else's code, which you start cursing and go, ah, because they didn't write any documentation. You have no idea what is head and tail. You say, what the heck is this thing? Why are you writing it? So all these things happen. And then you find out that's the code you wrote four years ago. <laughs> okay? And that's seriously, that's what it is. Okay? So, so be kind when you're writing code because usually it comes back and shoots you back in your foot, okay? So, uh, yeah. Well, that's that. We talked about that one, statically and dynamically allocated. Statically allocated memory is the memory that you define and the compiler creates and embeds it within your executable and it's there and inside your executable. So the more of you, those you create, the bigger your executable gets. The dynamically allocated memory 
out of that memory that you allocate, you ask the operating system to give it to you while the program runs. Those are all the DMA dynamic memory allocation that you have done. So all the dynamic memory allocation that you have done are those. They don't extend the size of the code. They are using the heap, but we're going to come uh, to it soon. And uh, uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, assume that we came to di statically and dynamically allocated memory in compiler lecture ex execution. Uh, please remind me that that's what we are going to do the next day we are coming in. So let's talk about uh, the, the lecture is over for today. Let me just stop this. Uh, I'm not going to stop this. So if you are listening to this, uh, we're going to have a chat on timing of our lecture on Monday. Okay? Please come on Microsoft Teams and take a look at uh, the discussion and see if you want to do what we want to do to make the lecture more uh, productive or not. Thank you. <laughs>